Here's our summary for today, part number four, Blood on the Doorpost. Before being delivered from Egyptian bondage, the Israelites had to apply the blood of the atonement to the doorpost. And before being delivered from sin, Christ's atonement must be applied to our lives. That's where we're headed today. Let's dive right in with question number one. Why is it important to study Israel's history? Now, all of these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. In other words, this isn't just dry history, right? It's not just dates and names and places. Maybe that's why you hated history when you were in school, right? The reason we study sacred history from the Bible, and especially the history of how God led his people, is because this history is being repeated, and it contains lessons for us today so that we can make the right choices. That's why it's important. Question number two, what did God instruct the people to do on the first Passover night? Let's go to Exodus chapter 12, Exodus 12, beginning in verse number three. Speak you also unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So every house, every family had to have what? A lamb. They had to have a sacrificial animal. Verse 5, Moses goes on, or God goes on, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So they couldn't just pick any animal, right? Had to be a lamb or a goat, and it had to be one that was without blemish, right? As perfect as they could find within their flocks. Verse 6, You shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, in the evening. So even though this was happening house by house, family by family, it would happen at the same time, wouldn't it? On the evening of their deliverance. Verse 7. Now, before we read verse 7, let me ask you a question. Was it enough that they simply kill the Passover lamb? No, because God has more instructions for them. Now let's read verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So yes, the sacrifice had to be killed, the blood had to be shed, but then the blood had to be applied where? Onto the door post and the side posts of the house. Verse 8, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Then there were more instructions. They shouldn't eat it raw, uh, nor sodden with water, but they were to roast it in the fire. Uh, the entire sacrifice, the entire animal was to be roasted in this fire. Verse 10, let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. That'll, that'll become important for us before we finish here. They were to completely consume this experience this Passover. They were not to leave part of the experience until the next day. Verse 11, Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it what? In leisure? No, eat it in haste. Why? Because they were about to leave Egypt. And who wants to stay in slavery longer than you have to, right? Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And now verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token or a sign upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will what? This is why we call it Passover. I will pass over your house or your family if you have the blood on the doorpost. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So here's a a bonus question that's not in your handout, but it's an easy one. How important was it for the blood to be on the doorpost? Very, very important. Life and death, wasn't it? 
How important was it for each member of the family to be inside the house where the blood is? You could put the blood on the doorpost, but if you were standing out on the front porch watching the show, you were in a dangerous place, weren't you? So the blood had to be applied, and you had to have that full experience according to God's instructions. Okay, let's apply this spiritually now. What does the Passover represent for us? Question number three. And we're going now to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the same book that we started in just a couple chapters earlier. What does the Passover represent for us? And we read in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our what? Our Passover is sacrificed for us. This is not the only verse in the Bible, of course, that identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who dies for the sins of the world. Now, the first part of the verse is important as well. In the Bible, especially in the New Testament, leavening or you know, yeast, anything that would make the bread rise, is a symbol, one of the symbols of sin and wickedness. And so part of the ceremony on Passover that we just read about in Exodus was to eat unleavened bread. So this would be crackers, essentially, right? And they were to, on this night, actually for several days during the whole uh, feast and ceremony, they were not to eat leaven or yeast because it was a symbol of sin. And spiritually speaking, in the verse we're just looking at here, this experience of the Passover for us. Yes, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. What should that look like in our lives? He wants to get the leaven or the sin out of our lives, doesn't he? And he wants us to be renewed in him. We read from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 277. The Passover was to be both commemorative and typical, not only pointing back to the deliverance from Egypt, but forward to the greater deliverance which Christ was to accomplish in freeing his people from the bondage of sin. So that makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? As we study what happened on Passover night, including the sacrificing of the animal and the applying of the blood, it's all a lesson for us about what Jesus must do in our lives to free us from sin. Now, you know this verse probably, 1 John 1, 9, right? How many of you could say it without even reading it? If we confess our what? Our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice the two parts of what Jesus does for us. When we confess our sins, he forgives us, part number one, and then what else does he promise to do? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the same two parts we just saw in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Christ, our sacrifice, is uh, sacrificed for us. There's the blood, but the effect should be a cleansing or removal of the leaven or sin from our lives. So, the atonement must be accepted and applied. Again, pass overnight. If all you did was kill that lamb, but you never applied the blood to the doorpost, was your family protected? No, the blood had to be applied. So let's look at these two parts to the atonement, and we'll take the accepted part first. What does it mean to accept the atonement, or how do we accept the atonement? This is question number four. We'll go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. How do we accept the death of Christ on our behalf. What does that look like in our lives? Acts chapter 2. This is on the day of Pentecost, and Peter is preaching. And he's finished his sermon, and the people have been convicted, and they said, what do we do? And so Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive what? Ah, the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are three steps here, or three things that they were to do, and they are sequential. Number one, they were to repent. What does it mean to repent? It means that I admit my sinfulness and my need of a Savior. I'm sorry for what I've done to Jesus. I recognize that my sins alone are enough to put him on that cross. 
and that he would have willingly gone to the cross if it was just my sins alone. If that doesn't bring us to repentance, what will? So repentance also literally means to turn around. So if you're headed the wrong direction in life, to repent in the original language literally means to turn around and go the other way. We admit our need of a Savior. The second thing Peter said is that we must be baptized. Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? He said, if you are able, you have the opportunity, be baptized. And baptism is a symbol of surrendering our life to Christ. It's new life, right? This is why Jesus is baptized in water as our example, completely submerged, right? He didn't leave a hand sticking up there and said, I'll give you 99% of my life, but I'm going to keep my hand or my, my thumb, right? Or I'll stick my big toe out of the water. I'm going to hold back a little bit just in case. Baptism represents a complete surrender of our old life. Let that die. Give me new life in you. And God promises to do this, and he has the power to do it, but he has to have 100% of us. Because as long as there's a little bit of cancer left, it's going to keep spreading. And the third thing that Peter says is that we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You look at the symbols of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. There are, there are many, but there are four primary ones. There's wind, there's water, there's fire, and there's oil. And those are the four ways that we produce electricity in this wor world, even today, right? The Holy Spirit is the power of God in our lives. We have no spiritual power at all, except what comes from the Holy Spirit. And so the purpose of repentance is to lead us to the place where we recognize our need of a Savior. We respond to that by being baptized. That's a symbol of the decision to completely give our lives to God and say, I'm going to trust you. You died for me. You sent your son to die for me. I think it's safe to trust you with my life. And in response to that decision, God promises to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And that gives us the power to live the way that God has asked us to. It's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Accepting the atonement. Desire of Ages, page 466. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. True, we have no power to free ourselves from Satan's control. But when we desire to be set free from sin and in our great need cry out for a power out of and above ourselves, the powers of the soul are imbued with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit and they obey the dictates of the will and fulfilling the will of God. So how does God get the leaven of sin out of our lives? He has to wait for our decision, our request. We have no power to do it on our own, but God cannot and will not work with his power until we give him permission. And he's just waiting and he's working to bring each of us to the place where we are ready to give him that permission. That's accepting the atonement. Now, the other half... What does it mean to apply the atonement in our lives? Or how do we apply the atonement? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. So after we have confessed our sins, after we have repented, after we have given our lives to Christ. Now, practically speaking, what does it look like as the Holy Spirit begins working out this transformation in our lives? Is our work done at that point? No, the blood hasn't been applied to the doorpost yet. We've accepted the blood of the sacrifice. So here's what we read. Deuteronomy 11, beginning in verse 18. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, what words do you think Moses is talking about? CNN? The latest comic book? No, it's the Word of God, isn't it? It's the law of God, which Deuteronomy is centered around. So he's talking about the Word of God. What should they do with it? Verse number, um, sorry, this should be verse 19. You shall teach them, your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So is there any 
point in the day or any experience that you or your family would go through where the word of God should be excluded from that experience. No, Moses is making it pretty clear, isn't he? Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, whoever you are with, take the word of God with you. And then look what he says in verse 20. And thou shalt write them the words of God upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. Here's what it means to apply the blood of Christ practically to our lives. It means to take this book right here, the word of God, and with the Holy Spirit's power and help to begin applying the word of God to every aspect of our lives. This includes how we think, how we speak, of course, how we act, the decisions we make, how we use the things that God has entrusted to us, everything. Applying the blood of Christ to our lives. Now in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, we read this. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. So he's talking about here about the, the earthly sanctuary and the rituals that the priests went through here on earth, right? It was, it was all ritual cleansing that took place. And so he's going to co contrast that and compare it with the blood of Christ, the only sacrifice that can remove sin. What does the author now say? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Yes, the atonement provides for forgiveness of sins. Amen. How do we, how do we get forgiveness? There's nothing we can do. We simply accept Jesus as our Savior. But then that same blood must be applied practically to our lives, just like they had to smear that blood on the doorpost. And what does that look like as Christ begins taking control of our minds, purging our conscience? Does the Bible talk about the mind of Christ? It does, doesn't it? We're told that we should have the mind of Christ. So we can think and look, how did Christ live? How did he interact with people? How did he interact with the powers in the world at his time, right? Let me offer a few suggestions of what a renewed mind looks like in our lives today. The renewed mind, like Christ, does not seek position or power, whether at home, at work, or in the church. Would you agree with that? Yeah, Jesus was pretty clear about that, wasn't he? The renewed mind, like Christ, obeys God even at personal expense or loss. Do we see that demonstrated in Christ's life? Yeah, he had to pray three times there in Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. But he made that decision. The renewed mind, like Christ, surrenders everything we are and everything we possess to God's glory. Did Jesus make that decision in heaven before he even became a human being? He did, didn't he? The renewed mind, like Christ, sees in every person a child of God that needs more than anything to realize God's love for them. Do we see that illustrated and demonstrated in Christ's life? He went and touched the people that nobody else would touch. He interacted with the people that nobody else would interact with. He calls us to be the same way, doesn't he? The renewed mind, like Christ, believes God created this world in six literal days. That's pretty important, isn't it? Jesus believed what Scripture said he did thousands of years before. <laughs> and we find it there in the Gospels. He absolutely believed that God created everything. Now, if you're going to take this position in the world today, you're going to be different from much of the world, aren't you? And people will ridicule you and mock you. It's interesting. Uh, I've been posting little shorts, experimenting, experimenting with these YouTube shorts that you've probably seen, just a few seconds of video, and I've had one of my sermons chopped up on creation and what the universe tells us about God, kind of a science and religion uh, message. And I will tell you the amount of negative feedback that has come back on the comments is just overwhelming. A lot of people cannot deal with the idea or the thought that, that we are created. Jesus believed it. A renewed mind will also accept that fact. 
The renewed mind like Christ worships God as creator by observing the seventh day of each week as sacred and holy. Did Jesus worship on the seventh day? It was his custom, the Bible tells us, Luke 4, verse 16. If we want to be like Jesus, then we'll do the same thing. The renewed mind, like Christ, recognizes the continuing validity of God's Ten Commandment law and will seek to obey those commandments out of love for God. Didn't Jesus say that uh, the law will never pass away until everything is accomplished, until heaven and earth pass away? And uh, I looked outside this morning, and I can tell you, heaven and earth are still here. The renewed mind, like Christ, values the importance of history and rejects the canceling or rewriting of historical facts for the sake of being politically incorrect. The renewed mind believes, like Christ, that God destroyed this earth in a flood of water. It recognizes that the climate has been changing every day since then and will continue to change until the earth is destroyed by fire. It will never use these facts to promote unbiblical agendas. You take that position, you'll run against the current of the world right now. The renewed mind remembers, like Christ, that God's kingdom is not of this world. It never attempts to establish God's kingdom or fulfill the divine mission of the church through human politics or human power. It realizes that human methods can never cure the spiritual maladies of a nation. Jesus was pretty clear about that too, wasn't he? My kingdom is not of this world. The renewed mind accepts, like Christ's parents did, responsibility for the education and training of its children and does not entrust our youth to an education system that excludes parents from decision-making processes, promotes gender confusion, teaches evolution, and forbids prayer or Bible study. And that's the short list. The renewed mind, like Christ, recognizes God as the true healing power in this world. It does not blindly trust a medical system that is controlled by money and politics, strips doctors of their credentials for questioning the status quo or prevents them from encouraging natural remedies, and that is complicit in forcing people to inject unproven, experimental, or dangerous drugs into their bodies. That's not how Jesus healed. The renewed mind, like Christ, recognizes the shortcomings of God's people, yet never God calls God's church Babylon. It refuses to become an accuser of the brethren. The renewed mind, like Christ, realizes that the whole world lieth in wickedness and never promotes the world's agendas within the walls of the church. The renewed mind, like Christ, believes in the power of God's promises to protect from sin. It does not continue falling for decades into the same temptations and sins and assume that God doesn't care about it. The renewed mind, like Christ, always remembers that the only source of spiritual power comes from heaven. The renewed mind, like Christ, stands for truth and for its convictions, even though the heavens fall. The renewed mind, like Christ, always speaks the truth and always speaks the truth in love. And finally, the renewed mind, like Christ, works consistently and continually for the blessing and the benefit of other people. You could add other ways in which the renewed mind is demonstrated in a person's life. We must have the blood applied to how we think, how we speak, how we act, how we make decisions. But there is a warning as we look at how Christ was accepted. If we choose to live with a renewed mind, we will run counter to this world. When the voice of God awakens the dead, he will come from the grave with the same appetites and passions, the same likes and dislikes, that he cherished when living. God works no miracle to recreate a man who would not be recreated when he was granted every opportunity and provided with every facility. So when must this transformation take place? When does the blood have to be applied to our lives? It's not at the second coming. It's not at the resurrection. It has to be now. During his lifetime, he took no delight in God. He found no pleasure in his service. His character is not in harmony with God, and he could not be happy in the heavenly family. We want to be happy in the heavenly family, don't we? And so we must have the blood applied to our lives now. Last question. How quickly did Israel leave Egypt after applying the blood to the doorpost? Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12, 
How quickly did God pull his people out? Did he leave them there for another year after the Passover? Did he wait a month or a week? Here's what the Bible says. Exodus 12, verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The next verse says, It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. How long did God wait to pull his people out of bondage and rescue them after the blood had been applied to the doorpost? He didn't wait, did he? It was that same night. It was immediately. What is the lesson for us? What is Jesus trying to do in his church? Turn with me, our last verse, Ephesians 5. Seem to turn to this verse frequently. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water, how? By the word. How does he get the leaven out of our lives? The Holy Spirit takes the word of God and he smears it on our doorpost. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and what? Without blemish, just like the Passover lamb. Jesus is looking for a reflection of himself in you in your family, in this church. And he will work until he sees it. Praise God that he's faithful and doesn't give up. You've heard this statement before. Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of whom? Himself, where? In his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, when his mind is reflected in their lives, then he will come to claim them as his own. And friends, he won't wait longer than he has to. He won't wait 10 more years or one year or one day longer than he has to. When he sees his character reflected in his people and that blood has been completely applied to their lives, he will come back and claim them as his own. 